just early on, this is not me. <laughs> I do have some vague archery skills, but I'm, I'm probably not as good as he is. Um, my wife thinks I actually look a lot more like this guy. Um, he restores things in the UK, apparently. Uh, some people think I'm him, and I am. Um, I've been working for a global insurance company, JLT, for the last 12 years. Um, my last day with them is on Monday, actually, which is a bit scary. In doing that, um, I've done a lot of different roles, and one of them has been um, putting together a UI style guide, which is something I've been working more on more recently. And that's the basis of why I'm here in front of you today. Before we get into that, though, this thing here is a stair ramp combination, which a lot of people call a stramp. This is going back, um, Rico took us back to the early 90s before I'm going back to the 1960s. Um, if anyone was alive back then, then they're a lot older than I am. Arthur Erickson designed this as part of Robson Square in Vancouver. Uh, and the, the concept of this was universal design so that the requirements to, to meet everybody's needs were built into the basic architecture rather than something that's added on as an exception. This is a very famous um, design, the Stramp, and it's, there's lots of replicas around the world. This was the first one that was built in the uh, early 70s. This is a really complicated poster that explains what universal design is, and if I didn't like you, I'd stick this on there, but I'll make it a lot simpler. The principles are um, designs need to be equitable. They need to be able to, they need to be used by people with diverse abilities. So no matter what um, disadvantages you may have coming in, um, you'll still be able to interact with something. The design should be flexible. It should be able to be used in a variety of ways according to preference. If I'm a left-hander, should I not be able to use scissors? Or maybe you can design some scissors that work with both. It should be simple and intuitive. The design should make sense without, without requiring a manual. Now, this, this is something that gets raised quite often. We always talk about making designs intuitive. In practice, it's not that straightforward. When we talk about touch designs, we say, Touch UI is really intuitive. You can pick it up and it just works. Everyone knows what to do. But it's not the case. The first iPhone shipped with a manual explaining how to pick up the phone and tap it because people didn't really know what to do. There is a lot of research behind it, but a lot of our behaviours that we think are intuitive are really just us adjusting to our environment. So it always needs to be taken into account. Your intuitive design for 10 years from now won't be the same for the one that's around right now. Design should be perceptible. If you can't see it, it doesn't exist. With uh, young babies, it takes them eight months before they achieve ob object permanence, which is when you go like this, they realize that you're still the same person there. Um, as adults, and when, when we're interacting with something, if we can't see that it's there, we don't know it's there. So don't hide anything from, from anyone. And perceptible, of course, varies according to the different requirements we've covered before, being equitable and flexible. So if someone is uh, unable to use their legs, then you need to allow them to use a wheelchair or something along those lines. Design should be tolerant. Now, I've seen videos of uh, people crying when they get an error message in a web browser. Um, you need to be aware of that when you're actually creating something, that your decisions as a programmer or a designer actually have a really direct impact on people's emotions. And what we need to do is try to uh, anticipate where people will fail and ease them through the process so that they don't feel like they're doing a bad job when half the time it's probably just a bad design in the first place. Design should be low effort. You shouldn't have to do gymnastics just to use something. 
any Photoshop users out there, if you've um, gotten used to exporting images for, save for web, that keyboard combination is a nightmare. The, the guy who actually came up with that um, did it almost as an aside because it's like, we need to do something. There aren't that many keys left. No one's really going to use this thing anyway because who cares about the web? And every Photoshop uh, user ever since has just hated the guy. He wrote a blog post about it a while ago. Um, but forgive him because he didn't mean to. <laughs> uh, design should be uh, within the right size and space, so appropriate and available regardless of individual abilities. If I'm trying to access a train station and I've got a pram, I should be able to get there just as easily as if I'm walking. Moving on a few years, the web came along and accessibility was a bit of an afterthought, unfortunately. Um, but we realise now that accessibility is integral to what the web needs to do. Everything we do needs to be accessible at some point or other. As Joe Landman says, he's uh, one of the, the members of the government digital services team in the UK. Accessibility is separate from user needs because you might survey your clients and say, you know, do you need it to be uh, mobile friendly? Do you need it to, um, to work on low bandwidth or anything else like that? Do you need it to be accessible? Don't ask that question because it needs to be accessible. They may not know, they probably won't know, but then they'll hire someone who's got um, a vision impairment and are they able to use their products? Maybe not, and you could affect someone's livelihood based on your decisions. And the essence of what Joe says here is design or services should be accessible to all. This is the, the crux of universal design. What we do should be available to everyone. The internet ex is exploding around the world, especially as um, the next 1 billion users jump on uh, with the mobile internet. And it's really important that we actually make our services available to everyone who's there. Now, through my presentation, I will link to a number of different sites. To save you a lot of effort, you can just go to my blog and I've got all the links in there. Um, if not, I'll be posting the URLs as I go anyway. That's assuming you do actually want to follow along. Now, this is um, a UI style guide that I wrote working at JLT quite recently. Um, I've spent the last year or so working on this and the reason that we came up with, with it was that there are a lot of different products across the company. As I said before, JLT is a global insurance company. Global means you have software development teams all around the world and each of them has their own idea of what the colours should be within the company logo and things like that. Usually that gets handled fairly well when you have a good brand style guide. The concept of a style guide, and Rico touched on this before with uh, atomic design, is to actually have a universal reference for all your code, all your behavior, so anyone anywhere in the world can pick it up and just implement it and get it right. You don't have to think about it. One of the, the keys when we came up with this was to actually make this as good as it could possibly be. Um, that's, I think that's, that's me to an extent. I don't like doing things half-heartedly. So we set out a whole list of rules at the start of things that we wanted to do. And they essentially reflect universal design, even though I didn't realize it at the time. The first rule is no dependencies. And when you're starting out a new library, it's fairly easy to say this because what else have you got behind you? But um, no dependencies is a lot more complex than that because what I'm really talking about is things like this. Bootstrap, jQuery, Censure Touch, jQuery UI, you name it. If it's a front-end library, it's going to affect things at some point or other. So we immediately got rid of that. Ditching jQuery, I found, was really hard. This is basically what we did. Um, I thought it was going to be bad. I've been writing web things since the 90s. Um, so when JavaScript came out, it was exciting. So I've been writing it pretty much since the language was first put out there. jQuery came along and simplified a lot of things because there were a lot of compatibility issues at the time, but they're not really there anymore. And it was a big revelation for me to 
get rid of jQuery and actually move on to jQuery-less code again. It's a whole lot lighter. You don't have to load uh, 67K worth of a library on someone's browser just to execute something. And in the end, all your code is really fast as well, so you'll never fail a performance benchmark because you just have no baggage. It's fantastic. The essence of this goes down to what Marche here at Finboard says. Programmers credo, we do things not because they are easy, but because we think they are going to be easy. Um, there were hiccups. I had to basically learn how to write JavaScript again because you know, if you've ever done any hiring and someone says they know how to write uh, JavaScript, usually they mean they know jQuery and the, they're not the same. Um, the DOM has come a long way since um, jQuery first came in and you're missing out on a few things if you don't go native. Um, practically speaking, um, element dot query selector and query selector all take care of most of what jQuery does for you anyway. The next and the big thing was adopting ARIA roles. I'd always tried to make my code accessible over the years because I knew accessibility was an important thing. But I'd never really tackled a UI library like this before, actually getting into complex components. So I thought it was really important to um, embrace ARIA, which is the uh, W3 standard on accessibility, and make sure that we implemented those roles as well as possible. And the ARIA roles and properties, they're basically an extension on top of HTML. Um, that glue everything together. So if we saw with Rico's talk about how having really smartly named classes um, structures your CSS well, ARIA roles actually extend HTML semantics just that little bit more, just to get, um, have, have that meaning that wouldn't otherwise be there if you've got a tab control or a um, auto select or something along those lines. The key thing with this and the reason that we have the no dependencies first is, as Hayden Pickering says, you can't have CSS or JavaScript without HTML, so you have to get your HTML right first. If you're using something that's generated, this can be hard, but that's where having a really solid um, CSS naming scheme um, helps you immensely. I've integrated uh, this library into old SharePoint and it worked. Um, so if you're having trouble with it, then don't be afraid. If you can get SharePoint to do something, you can do pretty much anything. This is how I used to write um, modifiers. So this is using block element modifier or BEM. We've got our global tab and the actual tab element. And then down below is the selected state for that element. That's what we used to do. Getting into ARIA roles, it actually changed things a bit because you can actually select on the ARIA states. It actually, it, you're doing something directly with the element, not on the classes. This, strictly speaking, is no longer BEM. And the way that I use BEM is to take the essence of it and then extend it um, just to ease off the class congestion that can happen with BEM. So, strictly speaking, if you are using BEM, you probably wouldn't do this, but this is actually better, I find, because it makes a lot more sense. Even your uh, JavaScript is a lot more readable as well. Here you can see without knowing too much that I'm setting the selected state. When I first got into this, I got really overzealous and decided that um, these ARIA states are awesome. I can just write global selectors for them. And global in CSS is a bad thing, so writing uh, hidden, true, display, none, means that every time you've got something with RE hidden, true, doesn't show. What could be so bad about that? The problem is when you want to animate something, then you can't just hide it immediately, so that didn't really work. Um, so I quickly learned the errors in my ways and had a more sensible scoping naming scheme. Once you get into the documentation, it's actually not too bad. Um, reading W3C documentation is frightening at the best of times, but the ARIA authoring practices guide is actually really helpful because it gets straight into examples of what you can actually do, which is really rare for a W3C thing. Um, 
So you can look directly on how they implement different roles and get an idea of how it's actually meant to work. Unfortunately, things aren't perfect, so there are other people's work out there. Hayden Pickering's got a whole lot of other examples as well that can be a lot clearer than W3C ones. I did find that some of the examples in the ARIA, um, like linked from the ARIA site, didn't actually implement the roles correctly, which is a bit strange, so I don't know who checked them. Um, but just do a bit of searching around, you can get some really good um, groundwork for what you're trying to do. Speaking of which, when I first had, had to do a hierarchical tree picker, I found uh, Leah Veru's Awesome Please, which is as awesome as it suggests. It doesn't quite do what I needed to do, but it gave me a lot of the groundwork I needed to get started. So what we had was a really complex hierarchical structure and we needed a quick way of people to select a particular node within that structure. Um, it's a UI nightmare. We've had tons of variations of this over the years until we came up with this. I'll just jump to a demo to show you how it works. The big problem with this though is there are no ARIA roles for this. There's a tree navigation view and there's an autocomplete, but there isn't something that does both. So you need to read within the lines and once you get into the rhythm of it, the ARIA roles make a lot of sense. I'll just show you what this actually does. This is a live code demo, which makes me extremely nervous. We don't need to see the code. Everything's fine. This is a really early prototype, so when you're looking at how ugly it looks, then forgive me. If I'm typing in normally, I can select things based on my what I've entered. I can also use my arrow keys and select things. If I've not got that working right, I haven't. <laughs> like I said, this is a crude demo. Ah. I'll get to keyboard nav later on, but Combining the two made it really easy to work out what we needed to do there. One of the strange things with this is you've still got focus on the, um, the text input as you're able to navigate through the tree. And as you type, it filters accordingly. But there, is, there are no guidelines for this, so you really need to go on your own to work it out. Let's get through those. Okay. Um, the next rule is try to make things obvious, and this is a lot of universal design right here. Uh, it needs to be simple and intuitive, perceptible, low effort, and right size and space. Text sizing is the first one. If you can read this, then you're doing really, really well. And there's not really that much to say about text sizing, other than it's usually not as good as it could be. I can make it a bit better, so you can read that all right, but if I bump it up a bit more, then it makes a lot more sense. And the problem that we have here is we sit at these beautiful screens all day designing this stuff. The people who are using it are not us. There are cricket umpires who use our things and we know they can't see anything. Um, so you need to actually accommodate for every user that's out there. In essence, what you really need to do is bump your font sizes up a couple of points, maybe to 16 point as your baseline. You will get some um, hostility if you try to do this on a transactional site, but it actually works quite well. Most of what I've found is that you get just change resistance. Everyone's used to seeing something in 12 point, they'll complain if it's 10, they'll complain if it's 14. Um, once you change it to what it is, they'll get used to it in a couple of weeks and they'll be fine. With some transactional sections, you do need to adjust the font sizes according to what data you need to display on the screen. That's okay. But just make your baseline that little bit better and your users will thank you for it. In the past, we used to have uh, really small interaction elements because when you're using a mouse, you can hit a really small target on the screen. Um, this study shows that object size can have a very direct influence on the perceived weight of things. This is talking about physical things. 
but it still applies to virtual screens, uh, uh, designs on the screen. How big an element is determines how likely someone is to interact with it. If you have interactable elements such as buttons, you need to make them big enough for someone to actually interact with them. So the, the basic rule of this with mouse and keyboard was there for a long time, that something needs to be a big enough click target that you can actually reach it. Ten years ago, uh, pocket supercomputers became mainstream and the rules changed a bit because the difference between a fine cursor and a finger is quite significant. So we had to change, we actually had concrete targets here that gave us a better idea of what we needed to aim for. And we know what humans are like because we can measure ourselves. The average human fingers pad size is 10 millimeters. So when you're tapping on something, you've got 10 millimeters that you can actually work with. That's a whole lot bigger than a mouse cursor. We can generally hit targets as small as seven millimeters. Once you actually take into account screen resolutions and the like, you're basically looking at a minimum of 24 pixels by 24 of any given thing that you want someone to interact with. Google's old standard is 22 by 22. They've increased that to 24, but this is the minimum. The ideal is probably around 36 pixels um, in order to actually make sure people can tap it at all. The thing I've found with this though is even after you've done all your measurements, you need to test things in a browser. You'll notice with uh, the material guidelines for uh, spacing, um, there are clear spaces between each element as well. It's just as important as making sure something's big enough to interact with because when you get onto a real device and you're there with your, your clumsy thumb or something like that, then um, how you're using it's going to be a bit different from when you're designing this in a uh, mouse and keyboard situation. So testing on devices is really useful for this. If you're talking about color contrast, then something like an Ishihara plate like this would come into a lot of people's minds. This is the test for color, con uh, color blindness. And the key part of an Ishihara plate is that the contrast between the green and the orange hues here is not great, which makes it really hard to see. If you're color blind, you can't really work out what's going on. If they adjusted the contrast, color blindness or no, you'd still be able to work out what's happening. And that's really what you need to know with color blindness. The uh, W3C has put together a standard that you need to aim for, and they measure the difference between the, the contrast of, between the text and the background of any given scenario. Uh, so you might have light text on dark or dark on light or whatever it is, but basically you need uh, for something that's less than 20 points in size, you need minimum 4 to 1 um, contrast ratio. If it's greater than 20, you need to aim for a minimum of 3 to 1. How you do this is the hard thing. I've looked thoroughly in the past and I haven't yet found anything I can give to designers to say, hey, just run your design through this and you'll make sure the colors are going to be contrast friendly. Um, some tools that were out there in the past don't work anymore. It's a bit of a mess. Fortunately, on the browser end of things, it's a bit better. This is a plugin for Firefox, which immediately, luckily, the W3C site actually passes all this. That's good. But it shows you each element that's on the screen and shows you whether it passes the, um, the contrast test or not relevant to the size. There are similar plugins in every other browser that you can think about as well. I highly recommend doing this. As soon as you actually get someone else's design and have a look at it, run it through this color contrast analyzer and you'll see right away if something needs to be fixed. This can be really bad when you have to tell a client that the color of their main logo isn't actually accessible and you need to change it. Um, it's painful, but yeah, you have to deal with it sooner or later. If you don't, then people just can't read what you're doing. So make the choice. One of the complex things with this is when you have complex background images. And this is a site that actually lets you test that out. 
I've found over the years that you get used to it, basically. So if I'm looking at someone's design, I can usually tell if it's going to throw an error or not in the contrast analyzer. Until you get to that point, you need to use tools like this. And even still, I don't trust myself because human perceptions are not exactly stable. Um, so this shows that the dark blue over on the left and the white is okay, but when you're moving over, the text doesn't actually work anymore. Once again, it's down to the programming end to test this out. You could throw this to a designer to get them to test their designs, but it, it's quite ugly at the moment. You still need to have this conversation for it to work. One of the key things to remember with color contrast is it's not really about um, people who have vision problems necessarily. It's about, especially these days with mobile devices, using that device in a particular situation. If I'm out on my, my phone in bright sunlight, my contrast is not going to be as good. Even here with a projector, projectors have notoriously bad color. Um, so everything we've got, got up on the screen is a lot harder for you to perceive than it is on my really nice um, display here. There's never a situation where you can assume that there's not a contrast problem. It's going to pop up sooner or later because we're using, um, we're using websites and applications everywhere these days. It's not just in a locked room in the basement anymore. Because we're human, we don't do anything right. Um, having really strict contrast ratios don't exactly work. Even though this is the recommendation from the W3C, it's a good starting point, but it's not everything. Now, the team at Shopify, the UX team, actually looked into this because they had the designers complaining, and I've had this myself. Well, I'll say that it looks okay to me, and here you are telling me this tool says it's not. Like, clearly, the tool's at fault. Um, the computer's bad, not me. It's always the computer's fault. In this situation, it's actually true to an extent. Humans don't perceive colors in any equal measure. We see a lot more green spectrum than we do of any other color because that's how we've biologically evolved. What it means in practice is that objectively, the color on the left, the black on the red, is a whole lot clearer than the one on the right. Actually, that's left and right, sorry. The white on the, the red is, is meant to, it doesn't actually fail the contrast. But it's actually easier to read. It's pretty close, depends on what screen you're looking at and the like. But this is where the, the, the maths don't actually work anymore. And the maths get a whole lot more complex, which is not so great when you're talking about design things. The last thing you want to do is talk to a designer and say, you need to learn this formula you'll probably get thrown out. Um, but all this really basically tells you is there's a lot more to it than basic contrast. This is from a 1992 book on highway designs on signs. Um, because signage on highways has to be legible. There's just no way that you can get away with it. Like you can put something up on the web and no one will notice and it's all right. If you get a sign that someone can't read and there's an accident, someone dies, you're responsible for that. That's not so good. Um, and this formula actually shows that our perception is correct, at least insofar as the text we think is more legible genuinely is once you take into account some other factors. Putting the obvious bits together, um, I'll talk about buttons for a bit because buttons get murdered often and deserve a bit more love. When Apple introduced iOS 7, they scrapped all the, um, the touchy-feely, you know, make it look like a real-life object concept and went for the flat design that's pretty much everywhere. Microsoft introduced this first with Metro, um, which is now called something else because they lost the rights for that. Uh, but Apple were the ones who got the device out there and made everyone actually pay attention. Metro actually works really well because the borders between everything are really, um, really clear, whereas in iOS 7, they're not. I don't know how big the tap targets are down the bottom. 
I have some idea this is it's a bit of a grey area because it does depend on where objects are on the screen and how you interact with them. So you can change the rules a little bit. But generally speaking, this is not a great idea. And Google followed suit. They copied Apple's copying of Microsoft, who copied it from someone else. Um, this is from the material guidelines. The first button here, the floating action button, it's got a nice shadow on it. It's pretty clear to see that I might actually interact with that. The raised button in the middle, that's got a slight shadow. It still looks like I'm going to do something. The one on the end, what on earth is that? How, how do I even know where my finger's meant to go or my mouse? How, what's the border of it? What do I need to do? What's the hover state going to be like? I've got no idea. This is in the current standards. And you will often get this where someone will say, well, Google did it, so it must be okay. But it's not. It's really not. Um, this is an example uh, from Materials Design Guidelines. It's a coincidence that it's Australian. I didn't rig this in any way. Um, on the left is their example left is their example of what is good on the right is their example of what is bad i completely disagree with it they've made it quite garish so like you could tone down the shadows a bit on the um on the buttons that have them but at least you can actually see what you're meant to interact with this is a really bad ui trend we do know better and we should do better than that and what you really need to end up with is um, something along the lines of this. This is from the uh, US government design standards, which is currently in writing. You can really clearly see how big each element is. You know that it's going to be something significant because it has a stark contrast with the background. The text is big enough to be legible. It has animated um, interaction states. So when I hover over or if I focus it on it, I can actually see them interacting with the element. This is where you need to be. Anything less than this, you're making it hard to use. Apple have learnt their ways with iOS 10. Um, they're getting a lot closer to this kind of thing. But the backlash is there. I mean, this is still really getting back to what Microsoft did with Metro all those years ago. Um, they really had it right in the first place. It just when it got copied, the, uh, the message got a bit lost along the way. But the essence of this is actually providing appropriate feedback. If I push against the door, I know how heavy the door is just from the weight of it. If I interact with something on a computer, I don't have that physical thing yet. Um, haptic feedback is still a bit of a work in progress. We need to give some kind of visual clue to people that something's going on, and that's where this is absolutely crucial. Keyboard access. This is one of those things where earlier on I said, we do things because they, we think they're going to be easy and, and just not. Um, keyboard access is probably the most important part of accessibility because, great, you've got a mouse to do a lot of things, but what happens if you don't? What if you're, you're blind and need to use a braille keyboard or countless other reasons that you may not be able to use a mouse? Um, even for user convenience, enabling keyboard access makes a big difference because using a mouse all, time, all the time can add a bit of a strain um, if you're not set up in a perfect ergonomic way and very few people ever are. It's not that bad. I thought it was going to be more of a nightmare than it is. In practice, there are only a few keys that you actually need to support and they are tab, enter, space and the arrow keys. That's only a few keys. It's not that terrible to think about. The spec for it is really good as well. The W3D spec, or the ARIA spec, actually goes into the detail of what happens when you press each key. If someone wrote this as a software spec for you and you received it, you'd be over the moon for the detail it goes into. It's really good. So of all the, the ugly W3C things that are standard specs generally anywhere, this is one of the better ones that's out there. It can get confusing trying to work out what's going on, which is where examples make a lot of sense and they link to them. 
Um, sometimes it just takes a bit of playing to work out exactly how the keys interact with each other. Trying to remember the different focus states takes a bit of effort. It's a bit like playing with animation the first time. It's a lot easier than it sounds when you first get into it. But once you get things right, it makes a lot of sense. Starting out with keyboard nav, the first thing I actually got stuck into was tabs, because I thought, how hard can tabs be? Um, tabs are a lot harder than you would think. Fortunately, I mean, the first thing I do is basically put into Google tabs accessible. And that's what you should do, just add ARIA or accessible to your search and it will just make everyone in the world a whole lot happier. Um, Remy Sharp's tabs came up quite prominently and he's, he's done a lot of work on looking through the history of, of tabs on the web, how poorly they've been executed and how we can actually do things right. He set down some ground rules of what he wanted to achieve. Um, and he got most of the things right. At first he was using jQuery, but then he got rid of that because you don't need jQuery to do tabs. Um, there were a few other little bits and pieces, but I took from that and turned it into this, which is, I've written a blog post about this as well. Um, this is basically a fully accessible working um, demo time. Um, tab and it's a tab so it's not going to be the most exciting thing you've ever seen before. I'll try to make it interesting somehow. Using normal mouse I can just interact. You can. This is proof of concept again so don't pretend these colors are anywhere in production or near it. Um, so that's great. I can select the different tabs. If I start using keyboard, I can select them as well. So here I can select my tabs based on what I'm doing on the keyboard. I've gone a bit too far, there we go. One of the things that's often missing with tabs is state. And a lot of things on the web is you, we lack state. You refresh the browser and it's just like I've forgotten everything about you. Um, I'm just going to refresh that and it's remembered. There's the storage API that's out there. It's been out there for years. It's really well supported. All you need to do is throw a few values into it and you've got something that works. You might question what that's got to do with accessibility, but accessibility is really about design and making things work properly, irrespective of people's needs or requirements. Making a tab that refreshes and remembers which tab you've got highlighted is something that should just happen because it does in other environments. On the web we say, oh, it's too hard, just not going to do it, but it's not that hard. So a little bit of effort, we can actually make these things happen. Since my demo's worked, I'm going to skip through. Um, one barrier I ran into with keys was um, trying to catch keyboards, uh, keyboard events. And I thought having written JavaScript for almost as long as the language has been around. I thought I knew keyboard events really well, but I didn't. There's the standard W3C way of capturing a key, which is event.key, and that returns something like up arrow, it returns a string description of what the thing is, enter, space, something along those lines. Unfortunately, browser support isn't complete. Chrome supports it as of version 51. We're up to version 53 now, I think, so it's only recent. IE 11 um, and higher do, so Edge does as well, but 10 and lower don't. Safari doesn't support this at all, although since Chrome support it now, then I assume that Apple will uh, deem it worth copying. Um, Basically, you need to support the old way, which is char code, and that returns an ASCII key. And if you want to get even older, you need to do this. JavaScript is an awesome language because you can just do this in one line, which is fantastic. If I have an event.key, then I'll grab that value. If I don't, I'll just give me the char code. If I don't, then give me the key code. This captures everything. Use a switch statement, and you're done. Um, you'll notice with the non-standard string in the middle, this is IE's non-standard interpretation of how things are meant to be because they did theirs before the spec was written properly. And naturally, Microsoft can't do anything right exactly the first time around. 
such credit for them of trying in the first place, but they haven't updated it, unfortunately. So at this point, I need to show a kitten slide every time I present something. Um, everything's perfect, which is great. My last point, which I've touched on already, is go with the flow. Accessibility is making sure you don't break things that are already there. And this is one of the things, if you ever work with Disney, then the first thing they tell you is you do not touch the mouse. Whatever you do, you can change the colours in the background, you do whatever else you want to do, do not touch the mouse. For us on the web, the mouse is the browser. We have our expectations of how we're going to interact with the browser. The back button should work. The forward button should work. I should be able to refresh it and it's just going to happen. It shouldn't be that hard. These are the things in the principles of universal design that we need to actually take into account. I've already showed you that demo on that. I'll finish on this point. Um, there's a company, OXO, that makes consumer products, peelers, for example, and they were founded in 1990 by Sam Farber when he saw his arthritic wife trying to use a peeler and she was having trouble. So he spent quite a bit of time prototyping. You can see all the different versions he went through to get to the final product to make a peeler that actually worked for her because he thought, why can't someone who's got arthritis use a peeler? The end result is far superior than the peelers that were there before. And OXO exists as a brand, not because they make things that adhere to universal design, but because their products are good. And there are a lot of sticks I could throw at you and say how you might get sued if you don't make something accessible and so on. I could do that, but I'm not going to. The carrots are much more enticing. If you make your products accessible, then you make them better. You make them better for everyone that uses them, not just the ones who absolutely need them. You will be able to find stuff. <laughs> cool. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, thanks for a great talk. So, you uh, spoke about a lot of methods to make things accessible. My, I have a slightly different question. What have you found any methods to make uh, developers, designers more, uh, you know, ha create more empathy towards uh, users who need, uh, you know, accessible interfaces? Because I, I see that like hugely missing. Um, is there anything that you've come across to make that happen? Yeah, um, I've done a lot of work on forms design in the past, and if you show someone a video of someone crying when they get an error message they will change their ways. It, it takes education, basically. Um, the videos are really good at this. Uh, there's an Apple engineer who um, is working on the Apple Watch, and when you see, she's blind and has been from birth. When you see her actually able to do things on her own, it's extraordinary. There are countless videos out there. You see someone who's got a hearing aid for the first time, and if you're not crying by the end of it, there's something wrong with you. And accessibility, that's, that's almost the stick level of things that I didn't really get into. But that, that's what accessibility is, is about to an extent. Personally, I think it's just good practice to do it anyway. But yeah, that's where it can really make a difference. If someone's unmoved by just doing things well, then show them a crying child. Hi, uh, here. Um, so I, I'm asking a question from say uh, the person who's paying the bill angle uh, and if they ask you what's the percentage extra that you might uh, have to invest in making it accessible uh, am i clear in my question yeah um so how much extra work is it to make yeah, accessibility I mean, happen th though it should be inclusive of the design process itself but for someone who has not embraced the process yet that would yeah. be the automatic question well that's where the stick arguments come in. No, because, I, understand, I understand the emotion yeah. part, but fr from a business angle, when they start off, they would probably Yeah, they're looking at the money that's into it, yeah. yeah. Well, the money that's into it is not getting sued. That's really important. Yeah. 
um, the money that's into it is if you adopt these practices at the right stage, which is immediately, I found it actually made my coding practices better. Um, I've been a much more efficient programmer by adopting the ARIA standards. Um, it's something I touched on earlier where the, the ARIA states make a lot of sense, selected, hidden, etc. Um, you don't get those interaction states on normal HTML elements, but you do with ARIA. Um, so it makes your code better, it makes you more efficient, it means that you'll get your product out. Um, really, it doesn't make any difference, it doesn't add any overhead. So, uh, would you have numbers from your experience like this probably, I mean, uh, you can say related to say at the end it would have cost us so much if you had not done it earlier, but it's not a big number to think of say a 10% or a 20% extra effort it takes to be more conscious about these things. Well, it shouldn't take any extra. Okay. The risk is when you're adopting third-party components. Uh, I mentioned Bootstrap. I hate Bootstrap. Um, bootstrap things, if it worked well, it would be awesome, but it just doesn't. They they try, but they just don't get things right, and their their goal is not the same as ours. Um, it is really tough when you're using third-party components or relying on them, and a lot of developers do. Um, I maintain and have done for a long time that it's much easier to write your own code rather than customize someone else's. Um, the problem is getting the talent to actually pull that off. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have more time. Please take all your questions to him offline. Thank you, Chris. You can reach me on Twitter, uh, my blog, and the slides will be up on the slideshow later on. Thank you.